Hello, students. It's again a great pleasure for me, your teacher, to welcome you to the Rasa online. So today, I welcome you to English Language 2. To English Language 2, this being our subject today. But again, to this topic, appreciating literary works. But to be more specific to this subtopic, which says basic concepts of literature. Last time, we are dealing the same, same subtopic. And today, this is a continuation of the similar subtopic, which is basic concepts of literature. My dear students, before we proceed, uh, I, I received a question to one of the students asking me on the concept of suspense. Ask me on this uh, particular concept, which, which is suspense. This concept, my dear students, I explained it last time. But this student is asking me how to create suspense in a work of art. I was so much happy that this, this student is interested now to create his own work or her own work of art. But his question wants me to, to explain how to create suspense in a work of art. Now, having, an, uh, having understood the term suspense, that uh, a feeling or a desire of knowing what will happen next in a work of art, now, such a desire, such desire or a feeling of knowing what will happen next, it's a suspense. Now, how can you create such suspense to make your audience remain more focused, remain more, uh, more becoming more concerned with such a, with a given uh, ritual work? Being a novel or a play or a drama that you create a work of art there's a point where you make your reader or your readers or audience establishing a desire or a feeling of knowing what will happen next. Now, here are the responses. You can create a suspense in a work of art either by, um, by starting with such a style in a plot called flashback. Flashback can help you to create suspense in a work of art. How? Now, when, as you be creating your work of art, you start with the last events. You put the last events at the beginning of a story or at, at the beginning of um, a drama or any work, any work of art. From there, from there, the readers or the audience will be much interested to know the, the final end of that particular work. Let's say, for example, a story about a famous person now who died. Now, that story starts with um, showing the people at the graveyard or narrating people who are at the graveyard. You as a reader, you as the audience, you'll be interested what happened. What was the cause of the death? What was the source of the death of this uh, famous person? Because the story um, you are creating has started with this style of flashback. But again, you may start with uh, the, the so-called foreshadow. Foreshadowing. Where you give hints or clues of events that will happen later in your story. You give the hints 
or some uh, simple or short cruise of think, things that will happen later in a work of art. From there again, audiences or readers of that particular story will be interested to know what that, what that kind of uh, story is, what the final end of that story or drama is. Because uh, an artist has just started with giving the hints of the things that will happen later. Now, obvious, you as a reader, you will be much interested. Then you remain focused to that particular story or to that particular work of art. But again, the other way of creating suspense by the use of dramatic iron. Dramatic iron. My students, I think you understand by this iron and its form. Verbal iron, dramatic iron, etc. So this also can help you to create suspense of knowing what will happen later in a work of art. Now, dear students, having that said, let us move to our topic today. But again, our session today will be guided by a similar question which asks, study the following expressions and identify the best literary term that fits the expression, students. This is a continuation of our, our previous topic. So here again, we come. Now, that expression that we, we, uh, we are supposed to identify the best literary term asks. That uh, wants us to identify the best literary term that fits in this particular expression. My dear students, I believe now um, you can tell that concept that fits, uh, fits in there. The one or one who writes plays, yes, you, you, you agree with me that um, the literal term that fits here is playwright. Remember that this is uh, the original term that fits here. There are students who, uh, when it comes to this particular area, they just put um, pray writer, pray writer. It's not this way. This, this will be, um, this is wrong. The best literary term that fits there is um, play right. Be careful the spelling. And not a uh, uh, play writer or writer of the play. No. In the same, same vein, I would ask you, the one who writes novel, let's say, novels, what would you say? Again, you agree with me that the, uh, the one who writes novels is author. But again, the one who writes um, uh, poems or poem, it's a poet. So today, I've just asked you to identify the one who writes plays. And the, uh, the response is this one. Tomorrow, who knows? So, uh, be careful um, when it comes to these particular um, expressions. Dear students, but again, here is, a, is our uh, next or second question. An act whereby an actor is alone on the stage, expressing his or her feelings. That when an actor is alone on the stage, expressing his or her feelings or emotions, He's shouting. Maybe he or she is disappointed. Or maybe he or she is so much ex excited. 
very happy or very very much happy it depends on the situation now he's alone on the stage now what the name of that dramatic uh, technique that fits in here for instance here take an example this is the stage right the, the place where i am here then i'm an actor i'm like oh today i must meet him because i've been telling him several times that bring back my money bring back my money today but he doesn't pay attention he turns his ears deaf today i want to show him i want to teach him a lesson now with that one my my, uh, my dear students that will be um uh, an actor is alone on the stage then he or she expressing his feelings he's not happy with the situation that he needs his money back from his friend or colleague but that colleague doesn't pay back the money so the, uh, the the character i mean the actor is alone on the stage he's expressing his feelings or emotions that he needs his money back now so we uh the term that fits uh, fits in here my dear students will be solilog That is a dramatic technique where we see an actor on the stage. He or she is expressing his feelings or her feelings. He's just alone. Take an example, a character or an actor has received a, um, a nice present or gift, a very expensive one very precious a great one now he or she is so much so much excited then he's like oh yes yeah i made it what a nice gifty but he's alone on the stage then he, he or she is expressing his feelings that he's so much happy that he has received something precious something awesome now one way ask uh in, in the same page or scenario that uh what is monologue monologue when a, an actor is alone on the stage he tends to speak to himself he tends to be uh, a sender and himself be uh, a receiver he speaks to himself or herself it's unlike a dialogue so today you have been asked in this particular way tomorrow who knows So you should understand also the concept of um monologue but again you should also understand the concept of dialogue Again remember that other concept like pantomime All these concepts should be at your fingertips you should be very familiar you should know all these concepts not claiming you should, you should know them very well and know how to apply uh, these concepts and when it comes to composing your own work then you may decide to include such um, concepts my dear students the next concept or question number 3 is the ritual term that fits right here a figure of speech where an artist uses words and phrases purposely to make a situation appear small or less important remember that this is literature my students and literature has its own um, rules own terminology own te technical terms or literary terms so you remember very well when i was ex explaining the concept of hyperbole the concept of understatement the concept of overstatement now do you, uh which one now here which concept that um uh supposed to be um 
to be placed here. Now, look here, my, my dear students. Look at this situation. Uh, take an example of a soldier who is, in the, who is in the battlefield is fighting. Now, while in the battlefield fighting, accidentally, he lost his, his leg. That very soldier, he make a phone call back home telling his family or telling his friends that I'm doing well, I'm fine. It's only that I got a wound on my leg. But the fact is that soldier has lost the entire leg, maybe this much or this place here. It has been taken away. But he makes uh, phone calls back home and telling his family that, well, I'm doing fine. I got a wound on my leg. But in fact, that man, that soldier, lost his leg. Now, that uh, soldier is trying to make uh, the situation appear more or less important. That why is he trying to, to make that situation appear more or less important? That he lost, he, he just got uh, a small wound on the leg. Now, you can agree with me that the concept that fits here is understatement. Understatement. Maybe you don't want you don't want, want his family to panic. And that's why he end up saying, I'm doing fine. I just got, got um, um, a wound on my leg. The statement or the expression reads, the statement that contains words or group of words whose meaning is different from the meaning of individual words. Now, can you take some few seconds to think of that particular term or basic term that fits in this particular area? Now, you agree with me? that that term that fits here is an idiom. Idiom. If I'm to ask you, can you give an example of an, an idiom, dear students, if today, if right now here, I'm to ask you, give an example of an idiom or an idiomatic expression Example of idiom or idioms include slip of the tongue, Now here are just um, are examples, few examples of, of idioms. Slip of the tongue, back seat, sit on the fence. These are said uh, among of the idiomatic expression that you may come across with. Now, now here, look at this one. This, this is an individual word. The meaning of which, the meaning of which, and it is taken, the meaning of us to sleep, is different from the, from the meaning of the entire sentence. If you are to take the meaning of individual word here, tongue alone, then this, this article there and the preposition of, it will be so hard for you to, to understand the meaning, the meaning of this particular idiomatic expression. That's, what that's why it says it contains words or a group of words whose meaning is different from the meaning of individual word, like one word, two, three, and four. If you are to take the meaning of each word here, you won't get the, the meaning of the, the entire thing. This is an idiomatic expression. The same thing here, back, sit, sit on the fence. You won't be able 
to get the um, uh, the meaning of individual word here, you won't understand. Students. So, uh, the meaning of this particular idiomatic expression, you should, you should take the entire statement or the entire expression. Back to you. If I'm to ask you what the meaning of flip of the tongue, what does it mean? Again, you agree with me that flip of the tongue means saying something accidentally or saying something by mistake. Then one end up saying uh, flip of the tongue. A couple of times, you students, even me, we do uh, say uh, some things by mistake. Then we beg an apology to our listeners. Back seat, what the meaning of the back seat? Again, um, if you are to take a back seat, take an example of a car, then you are seated at the back. Not that way. This is, a, an, this is an idiomatic expression. Therefore, you should understand the entire or the um, uh, statement or uh, group of words. For example, if one says the agenda of general election was given a back seat, the agenda of general election was given a back seat. Uh, with this example, one, you may take it in a situation, maybe you're in the meeting. You're in the meeting um, with uh, some big guns. Then one says, the agenda of general election was given a back seat. Now, with that one, with that statement, what does the um, back seat mean? My teacher gave a back seat to my opinion regarding environment issues. What does it mean? Obvious. You agree with me that um, uh, back seat means to ignore, to ignore, or not be given a priority, not prioritized. something um, was not prioritized or something was not given a priority, it's a back seat. Now, if you are to take the meaning of individual word in this particular idiomatic expression, back seat, back, then find the meaning, then seat, then you give the meaning, it doesn't work that way. It won't work. So the meaning of this particular um, idiomatic expression you should treat them as a, a corrective or correctively. Now, I'm making myself understood. The last one says, sit on the fence. To sit on the fence. Now, if you are to take in the meaning of individual word, the act of sitting, then on the fence, the actual fence that you know. So, again, it won't work. Treat these words or group of words collectively. Sit on the fence. Should you sit on the fence when it comes to making a uh, judgment or passing a judgment? My dear students, again, um, the meaning here now, to sit on the fence means to take no sides, to be neutral, to favor none. That's the meaning of um, to sit on the fence, to favor none of the side. Or to become neutral. Having that said, now let's just move to another uh, question. Well, my students, here is our expression. Refer to the manner whereby the events which are to appear later in a story are presented at the beginning of the story. If you are following me very well in the beginning, then here won't be a problem to you. So you go straight. And putting, that, putting the right concept there. Students, let's have a short break. Then we'll come back after a while. Thank you. Students, welcome back to our second session. Now, our next question 
which is number five, or Roman five, reads, refer to the manner whereby the events which are to appear later in the story are presented at the beginning of the story. Yes, uh, if you recall very well in our previous lessons, now here, again, it would be much easier for you to tell the basic or the, the concept that fits in here, which is a flashback. Again, uh, my dear students, remember all the concepts regarding uh, plot, regarding uh, the arrangement of events in a work of art. Remember the concept of foreshadowing. Remember the concept of flashback as, as, as it, is, it is written here. Remember the concept of chronological order or sequential arrangement of events. Today, you have been asked about flashback. Who knows about tomorrow? You and I do not know. So, um, be keen enough to understand such concepts very well. And if need be, be uh, if you are asked to identify in a work of art, tell the story, I mean tell um, the style which has been used in a given work of art, now, be able to tell that this particular artist has used this particular style. Or this particular playwright has used this particular style. This particular storyteller has been narrating his or her story from the beginning to the middle at the end, sequentially. Now, let's just move to another question. A dramatic device a dramatic device in which an actor on the stage speaks to the audience but other actors do not hear. My dear students again, take some few seconds to think the best concept that fits in that particular expression. It's a dramatic device in which an actor on the stage speaks to the audience. It's right here, maybe, me as your teacher here. Now, take an example, I'm acting. And you, students, you're my audiences. Remember, I'm not acting alone here on the stage. There are other act actors and, uh, and actresses that together with me. But in this situation, I'm alone, I'm alone here. I, I, I'm on the stage. I'm speaking to you as the audience. Ek baat mujhe batla do. Main Lakshmi Kya ka saath hai? But other actors or actresses do not hear what I'm saying. Now, what kind of that dramatic device that fits in the particular expression. Can you tell? As I said earlier, take an example, me, you're a teacher here, as an actor now. I'm acting, and you, I'm speaking to you, you as my audience. But my fellow characters do not hear. So now, identify the dramatic device that fits in this particular. So, you agree with me that uh, the dramatic device here that fits here is a side. It's known as a side, which has been very much common in so many um, uh, theater or in the cinema or in the movies where we see such a situation or in the comedies. Dear students, let us now move to um, Romans 7. Our expression uh, reads, it uses comic words to show someone's wrongdoings. Now, um, there are times, there are times 
you students tend to, to criticize your fellow colleague or your fellow student by using comic words. When you speak about comic words, we speak about words which sounds funny. The words which bring uh, laughter. The words which doesn't offend someone. You use sweet words to criticize someone. Maybe your colleague is misbehaving. Now, you don't want to make him or her feel offended. Then you're using comic words. You're using humorous words to criticize that particular person. Now, can you now tell the word or that term that fits here? Now, you'll agree with me that the, that concept is satire. Satire is uh, one of the little term that it, is, it, it tends to use humorous words to criticize or to show someone's weaknesses, someone's faults or failures. You know how it feels when somebody criticizes you using those um, offensive words. Obviously, you'll react. For example, if I'm to tell you, or you are to tell me, one tells his colleague that you, are, you speak a very beautiful, broken English. One says, you speak very very beautiful broken now look at this example that you speak very beautiful broken english now uh Again, you'll be able to tell me that the word beautiful here is such a comic word or a funny word. So you are criticizing someone's English the way he or she speaks. That is a broken English. But the way you're trying to criticize or to show how broken uh, his or her English is, you're trying to use this adjective like beautiful. That his English doesn't sound well or his uh, grammatical uh, grammatical wrong. It doesn't speak English which is, uh, abides to uh, the rules and the principles which governs um, that given language. So that is a tie. Students, now let's just move to Roman 8. As it reads on the board, on the screen, that the permit or ribbon taken by the poets to alter or depart from standard syntactical rules of a given language in order to comply with metrical requirements. Now, can you tell the concept that fits here? When uh, poets deviate, when they purposely deviate from this uh, syntactical rules of the given language, it's a permit. Look here, my students, a permit or a liberty taken by the poets to alter or to change, to depart or to deviate from the standard syntactical rules, the rules which govern the particular language. Now the poets tend to, to change or to deviate primarily to comply with the metrical requirements. Now can you tell the poetic term that fits here or the literary term that fits here when someone, for example, is like saying these steps is broken. Look here, my students. This particular uh, sentence, these steps is broken. If I'm to ask you what's wrong with this particular sentence, is it grammatically correct? Is it syntactically correct? I believe. You tell me, sir, uh, the word is here. Sounds weird, does not abide, does not comply with the, uh, the rules and principles which govern the language. 
But here, the poet is now composing the poem, and this is the, his first um, verse. Say, these steps is broken, students. Even Shakespeare, Shakespeare, the very famous artist, the very famous person in literature or in, in, in literary works, uh, among who, of his works, there are a couple times violates the grammatical rules, alter or depart from standard, um, from standard syntactical rules of a given language. He does so purposely. If today I'm to tell you, go and read Shakespeare's work, uh, poems and, and the other works, you see all these changing, altering. Now, in poems or in, uh, in, uh, in poetry, that act of violating, of changing, of departing from the standard rules of language is called poetic license. Poetic license. For them, when composing a poem, um, a verse which may read this particular way, my children is happy. Now here, there's something wrong here. Look here, uh, this being a subject, there's no concordial argument between a subject and a predicate. My children is happy. Now, by lacking such a concordial argument between a subject and a predicate, then um, uh, that person, that poet, is free, is okay. He or she wants to achieve the so-called metrical requirements or poetic um, effects. Maybe he or she wants to achieve the so-called rhythm. Maybe he or she wants to achieve the so-called rhyme, etc. The next concept, my dear students, is the framework that entails the manner in which a work of art is systematized in order to effect the desired message to the audience. The framework, my dear students, that entails the manner in which a work of art is systematized in order to effect the desired message to the audience. Remember, an artist, when he or she prepares his work, his artistic work, one of the key things that comes in his or her mind is how am I going to take this thing, go down to the audience? How? An artist may think of, let's say, um, he wants to write about women's circumcision. Then one thing that has to, come in, has to come in his or her mind is, how am I going to do that? If he, he or she has to, is to compose a poem, one of the things is, how am I going to get this thing or this idea reach the audience? That question, how, pushes us to a concept, to a literary concept, which is called form. You remember form, or in a work of art, there are those two, um, two key terms, especially when you are analyzing a work of art. We have a form and a content. So a form is that uh, structure, is that uh, superstructure, the way you arrange, the way you organize your thoughts. You may start to think of the title, that how should my work, or how, uh, which title fits in my work. Now, starting searching for a best title, now you, 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 are, th you are talking about the form. When you think about the language you use, you think about the form. When you think about the characters, you think about the form. When you think about plot, the arrangement of events, 
you are thinking about the form. Again, when you think about the uh, setting, you are also dealing with the form. It's all about the framework. It's all about the uh, superstructure of your work. Uh, this concept now is clear. But today, you have, been, you have been asked about the form. Who knows about tomorrow? Remember all the elements of, uh, of content again. Like theme, message, conflicts, philosophy, etc. All these are in here. So I encourage you, my students, to understand this stuff and be at your fingertips. Students, now let us move to Roman 10. And this is going to be our last uh, question. Now read with me this particular expression. A poetic device in which similar consonant sound is repeated at the beginning of which word in a verse of a poem. Now, the concept of consonant, you should be familiar. This word here, consonant, has to be familiar with you. Again, you can even go far of thinking of um, uh, vowels. If similar vowels are repeated, either at the middle or at the end, in a given verse of a poem. Well, now let us come back here. Take an example here. Do you remember the poem, Building the Nation? Yes, you should be. Uh, there is a verse that starts with similar consonant sound, and that verse reads, Delicate Diplomatic Duties Now, which sound here, which consonant sound has been repeated either twice or thrice? Again, uh, I believe you agree with me that the consonant sound which has been repeated is this one here. At the beginning of which word, sound do here and right here. It has been repeated. This sound, at the beginning of each word, this sound has been repeated. Again, do you remember the poem titled Ballad of the Landlord? At the, at the time when the tenant says, Landlord, Landlord. Now, look here, this sound here, at the beginning of each word, has been repeated. So, sound L has been repeated. Now, can you tell now, that device or that term, which fits in here? Again, you will agree with me that the term that fits here is called alliteration. Alliteration, my dear students, it's not enough for you to understand uh, this particular term, alliteration, alone. Now think other literary terms or other sound devices which, um, in, uh, which are found in, uh, in a poem. Think of assonance. Think of consonance. Think of rhyme, think of ry rhythm, think of meter, think of um, yambic. Now all these are found in sound device. So today you have been asked about uh, alliteration. Now tomorrow, what's going to be? Who knows? You and I 
I have no idea. So I encourage you again to read these um, uh, things here, assonance, consonance, rhythm, rhyme. Because they are all to do with sound device, my dear students. I'm glad that um, the lesson was clear regarding these concepts, literary concepts. Remember, in this particular uh, topic, appreciating literary works, together with its subtopic, which is basic concepts of literature. In this particular topic, it has six questions which are compulsory. So, I encourage you to make sure that all the literary concepts, all the basic concepts of literature have to be at your fingertips. Thank you so much for your attention. May God bless you so much.